I think I maybe have mentioned this to a few of you in the past, but a new practice that I've taken on weekly is to go over the text that I'm going to be preaching and the message that, that needs to be preached with Kayla. Now, I mean, we've talked about it over the course of the years, like we would talk about what I was preaching, but it's, it's become kind of a weekly practice where almost every week, uh, if we can make it happen, we'll go to breakfast together, uh, have some time together just without the kids. When we've got our babysitter at the house, we'll grab breakfast, have some time together, catch up. It's an important time for us. <clears throat> but then we'll read through uh, the passage that I'm going to be preaching. And we'll just have a conversation about what stands out, what's important, what's relevant, and it's become an incredibly uh, meaningful time. And I'll say this, you all would be privileged to hear Kayla's reflections on the scriptures. It's been so beneficial for me, um, and you don't know how much of my sermons um, are impacted and influenced by your pastor's spouse. Um, but it was this week was kind of funny. It was a, it was a little unique this week, uh, different than every other week. Kayla and I were at, we were at Leftfield Coffee. Uh, we were talking talking about Acts chapter seven, the passage that I just read. And after I read it, Kayla kind of turns to me and she goes, "I mean, what are you gonna say about this passage?" She said, are you, sh- "You sure that this is the passage that you want to preach?" And I said, "Yeah, I believe this is the text that I'm supposed to preach from." And 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 she said, okay, well, I don't know what you're going to do with that. And I and then we proceeded to have a really nice conversation about what's happening in the book of Acts, chapter 7. But it was a good question. And I think it was an important and appropriate question to ask when you're reading Acts, chapter 7, verses 54 through 59. What on earth can you say about this text? I mean, Stephen dies. He's the first martyr. What good news is there in this? I want my sermons to be sermons of good news. What good news is there in the stoning of Stephen? Perhaps it might help to set the stage just a little bit. There is good news here, I promise. I'll get to that. But we need to dig the diamond out of this dirt, and we need to lay a little bit of a foundation. What's happening here? Well, if you turn the page back, you'll find out. In Acts chapter 6, we're introduced to Stephen, who is a disciple with a Greek name. A Hellenistic Jew, that's what he was. The author Luke tells us that Stephen did many wonders and signs among the people. But not all the people were happy about this. There was one group of people in particular who had some issues with Stephen. The group of people who had trouble with Stephen were a group of people who called themselves the synagogue of the freedmen. That's what they called themselves. In verse 9 of chapter 6, we read that the synagogue of the freedmen was made up of Syrians, Alexandrias, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia. You catch that synagogue of the freedmen? They weren't from Palestine. They weren't from Galilee. They weren't from Israel. These were Greek-speaking Jews. The synagogue of the freedmen were Hellenistic Jews, Hellenistic Jews converts to Judaism. Something else that's important to note is that Stephen is not a quote-unquote Christian. Stephen is a Hellenistic Jew. Christianity as a distinguishable religion from Judaism, it doesn't exist, not yet. Stephen's a Hellenistic Jew, and he's not of the mind that he's different from these folks that he's talking to. Stephen, a Hellenistic Jew, is sharing the good news and doing many wonders and signs to other Hellenistic Jews. These are his people. He's not different from them. They're his. He was a Hellenistic Jew who recognized in Jesus the fulfillment of Yahweh's promised Messiah. So he's talking to other Hellenistic Jews about the good news that the Messiah has come. Now, he was certainly preaching something new to these folks and obviously challenging, but It was the synagogue of the freedmen, a group of Hellenistic Jews, who turned Stephen, a Hellenistic Jew, over to the Sanhedrin. I don't know if you knew that you were signing up for a course in Second Temple Jewish political systems, but the Sanhedrin was Israel's court system. That's Israel had a a court system 
and each region would have their own Sanhedrin. There would be courts in each region of the Jewish world, the Jewish diaspora even, and they, have, they had a Sanhedrin, and they were a group of religious leaders who weighed rulings in matters of religion and civil disagreements. And Stephen was forced to witness in front of what was called the Great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. You see, the Great Sanhedrin, Great Sanhedrin was essentially the Supreme Court. If you have all these lower courts, these lower Sanhedrins, then you get brought to the Great Sanhedrin. He's standing before the Supreme Court of the nation, a group of religious elders, and they had the, the, the power to determine that if someone was going against their faith, and if they were found guilty, the Sanhedrin could put them to death as what was called a Zakin Mamra, a religious, el- uh, rebellious elder. They held within their power to put to death someone who was a rebellious elder. And Stephen was found by the great Sanhedrin to be one of those rebellious elders. And what was his great offense? Did you catch what was so offensive about what he said? What we read in Acts chapter 7? I mean, maybe I should have put a warning before this sermon that it's going to be inappropriate for children because what he said was so offensive, right? I mean, he, he was standing in front of the great Sanhedrin and he said, Look, the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of the Father. Sorry, I warned you that it was going to be offensive, right? Because of that, they decide, well, you got to die. Because of that, what's, what's so offensive about that? To you and me, to us Christians, on this side of history, that might not seem like it's all that big of a statement. I mean, we confess it when we recite the creeds together, right? He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We confess it in our creeds. It's foundational to our belief. This is not an, offens- an offensive statement for Christians, but for these folks, for the Jewish religious leadership... To say that he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father, well, that was blasphemy. That was blasphemy. Stephen said he saw the Son of Man at the right hand of God. What that means is he saw a humanly one in God's divine courtroom. In front of the highest Jewish court, he claims that he can see the divine courtroom. In front of the highest court of the nation, the the most important religious courtroom, he says, oh, I can see an even greater courtroom. And in that courtroom, I see the Son of Man, a humanly one, standing at the right hand of God. He says he can see where God dwells. And who is it that's with God but a humanly one? And not just any humanly one, the Son of Man, the one who shows us what humanity truly is. And not just any man, but the man that they executed. What's so problematic about him saying he sees Jesus at the right hand of God? What are the implications of Stephen saying that he sees the one that they executed in God's presence? Hey, you remember that guy? You remember Yeshua from from that small town up north? You remember Jesus? Remember what you did to him? Oh, guess where he is now. What does that say about where they are then in relationship to God? On what side of God does that put them? The one you executed is is at the right hand of the Father. What does that say about their posture towards God? this religious leadership. And you want to know what's so crazy about all of this? Who was it that turned Stephen in? Who turned Stephen into the, into the Sanhedrin? Who brought false witnesses against him? Who was it that had such a problem with Stephen? Was it those Greek pagans who wanted to kill Stephen? Was it those Roman overlords 
You know what kind of death Stephen died? Jesus died on a cross, which is a political execution for enemies of the state. Do you know what a stoning was? That was a religious execution. That was a religious execution for blaspheming Yahweh. It was not pagans. It was not the Romans who oversaw the killing of Stephen. Nope. Was it those ethnic Jews from Israel who brought him to trial? Was it people who said, well, you're kind of a, you're kind of a Hellenistic Jew, and we're, we're, we're Israeli Jews, we're the Israelites, you're Hellenistic, so you're different, buddy. Was it those who brought him to trial? Nope. They will oversee his death, but they will not instigate the trouble. They do not bring him to trial. Who brings Stephen to trial? Stephen was eaten by his own. Stephen, a Hellenistic Jew, was condemned to death because of fellow Hellenistic Jews. And for what? And for what? We'll talk about that in a minute. But isn't that how it goes, church? Isn't that how it goes? I I mean, the question that I started this sermon with was the question that Kayla asked me, and it's the question I asked Again, what is there to preach about Acts 7, verses 54 to 59? What is there to say about this death of Stephen? Maybe something that needs to be named from this text is how frequently we eat our own. Maybe this text is important is because it reveals just how much we turn against our own. You see, Stephen was not of a different religion than the Sanhedrin. He saw himself as a Jew speaking to other Jews about the new thing that God was doing in Judaism. And it seems today that whenever people proclaim the new thing that God is doing, because church, I'm telling you, God is still doing a new thing. Even 2,000 years later, do you believe that God is is in the business of doing new things or was that only back then? Does God still do new things in the world through the church? I'm going to say this. If we don't think God is still doing new things, do we take seriously what we read earlier this morning from John chapter 14? What did we read in John chapter 14? Jesus told his disciples that when he is ascended to the Father, they will do greater things than him. Because I'm going to the Father, you will do greater works than I did. You see, God... God is doing even greater things because Jesus has entered the presence of his Father. It seems that to, even today, when people, people proclaim that God is doing a new thing, maybe even doing greater things than what has, had been experienced in the past because God is doing new things, it seems like even today people are liable to be stoned. Maybe not with actual stones, but I I think it's also fair to say that it's also not by those outside of the religious establishment. You know, one of the greatest persecutors of the church has been throughout human history, throughout Christian history, collectively, throughout the history of the church? Do you know who has persecuted the church? The church! The church! We like to think we're different than Stephen and the synagogue of the freedmen. But the greatest persecution of the reformers during the 15th and 16th century, it didn't come from those Germanic pagans. It came from the church, Catholics. The author of the Belgic Confession, which was written in 1561, was executed six years later in 1567 because he converted to what they called evangelicalism, what would be called the Protestant faith. That was not unique to the author of the Belgic Confession. Protestants were being persecuted by Catholics. Okay, so then what about the Anabaptists? Anybody know Anabaptist history here? Who, who persecuted the Anabaptists during the 16th century? Did somebody say everybody? Yes, 
the church. Other Protestants, John Calvin himself, did not end or stop or oppose the execution of an Anabaptist theologian, Michael Servetus, for questioning the validity of the Trinity. No, I'm not saying you should question the validity of the Trinity, especially not during the Reformation era. That was not a good time to question the Trinity. But maybe let's bring it a, maybe a little, bit, a little bit more contemporary. Remember back to elementary American history. Do you remember learning American history? Why did those Puritans come to America? What did they want? Religious freedom. They wanted to create their own synagogue of the freedmen, right? They were fleeing religious persecution. From whom? From all the Muslims in Europe? They were fleeing religious persecution from all those pagans in England. They were fleeing religious persecution from other Christians. If you want, you could have a real fun conversation about the history of Christian infighting in Ireland. So these Puritans colonize America for religious religious freedom from their own persecution, and it might be worth noting that those Puritans who fled their own persecution would become quite adept at their own version of it here. Now, I don't bring all of this up to say that the church is awful or the church is is this terrible institution. Sure, she is not without spot or wrinkle, no matter what the hymn says. Tis a glorious church, but we've got a few spots and wrinkles. But she is still Christ's chosen method of divine revelation in the world. Despite our brokenness, somehow Jesus says, y'all are my people. You're still my people. Maybe stop persecuting my other people. Despite her flaws, God chooses the church. I bring this up about the church to illustrate what we saw in Acts chapter 7 that Hellenistic Jews oversaw the execution of a fellow Hellenistic Jew. Because I think it illustrates that we reserve our deepest vitriol, we reserve our greatest criticism, and we reserve our most violent acts for those who threaten us the most, who, more often than not, are very much like us. We're not often threatened by people who are very distant from us. We're, very, we're not very often threatened by those who just feel foreign. Oh, instead, we're very threatened by those very close to us. You want some more evidence that we eat our own? That what we read in Acts 7 is not all that different from the world today? Get on Facebook. Pull up Twitter. Go check your news feed. Some of the greatest stone-throwing happens from a keyboard. Some of the most vitriolic, hateful things that are shared are online in a digital space. And more often than not, they're not against people who are actually all that different from us, but against those who threaten us the most. The biggest arguments we get into are more often than not with those who are closest to us. An unfortunate truth is that some of the greatest hurt in this world is reserved for those who are most like me. And here Stephen is. Here's this first martyr of the church being executed because of his own, being brought to trial because of his own people. And how does he respond to their violence? Does he respond to their violence with violence of his own? When they throw stones at him, does he pick them up and throw them back? One of my favorite songwriters and poets, John Foreman, sung, it takes two to go to war, but only one to fall in love. And here Stephen doesn't respond with their hatred with more hatred, but responds instead with love. I mean, 
how does Stephen do what he does? How can Stephen say as he is in the act of being executed? Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Show of hands. <clears throat> How many of you feel like 100% without a doubt, that's what I'm saying to people who are killing me. How is it that he does that? Well, instead of telling you, I want to show you. Brody's going to put an image up on the screen. And it's, I want you to tell me what you see. Can you gaze up at the monitors? I can't see what's going on. Is there a picture up there? Yeah. Maybe you can make out what that is, but it's kind of blurry, right? Well, I want to ask the ushers to come forward again and to help me out. If you would. Would you please distribute these to the congregation? This is one of the most sacred acts I've ever done in corporate worship. People in the front will obviously have an opportunity to see what's going on first. Oh, man, this is really fun for me. If you get sick from this, don't uh, put them on. <clears throat> and uh, this is really silly. Uh, we're going to do something really silly right now. We bought a whole, we bought 100 3D glasses. It's like we're back, going back to the movies in the 70s. Can you make out what's there? When everyone has a pair, I want you to look up at the monitors and tell me what you see. If you can, I'll be honest, we bought cheap 3D glasses, so they might not be as effective as the ones you get at the movie theater. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, they're, they're making their way, their way back. Oh, yeah, you turn the lights off. That might help. Um, I know this is silly. We're almost all the way there with all the glasses. Can, is something popping out maybe a little bit better than it was before? Maybe not, but it's a fun thing to do anyway. These are yours to keep, by the way. You can keep these. A little souvenir. You can keep the glasses. All right, the last few rows are going to get there. Once we get the last row filled out, Brody, why don't you go to the next image? What do you see here? Can you see what's in this first image? Oh, hey, there's another one. Great. I mean, you can see what that is, but when you put the glasses on, what happens? Kind of pops out a little bit, right? All right, Brody, go to the last image. Thank you, Dale. Yeah, I got to do this again. Can you make this one out? It's kind of standing out a little bit. So why couldn't, why would, why couldn't you make out what those images were prior to getting these three glasses? You were looking at the same thing, right? It's harder to see what's going on there, Right? What changed? Does the picture change? Did the image shift when you put your glasses on? The picture didn't change. The circumstance didn't change. What changes when you put 3D glasses on? Your ability to see it. Your perspective changes. You have a new lens. All right, we can take the pictures down. It's a 3D image, so it should look 3D to you. How, how, how is it that, we can turn the lights on too. Uh, how is it that Stephen for, could forgive those who were in the act of killing him? Well, go back to Acts chapter 7. What, is, what does Stephen say to the Sanhedrin? Look! Look! He said he was looking up into the heavens and he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand 
of the Father. And then what does he say to the Sanhedrin? He says, hey, 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 guys, look with me. Look, what I, look at what I'm looking at. Where is his gaze? I love that the text says, he gazed to the heavens. You see, the story says that this whole time Stephen was gazing to heaven, his gaze was fixed on Christ. His gaze was fixed upon Jesus. And what does he do but invite the highest religious court of the land to gaze up at the heavens with him? Look, I see the Son of Man. The heavens are open and the Son of Man is sitting at the right hand of God. And what do they do? They plug their ears and they shout. They fill their life with noise at the invitation to look to Jesus. I wonder how often we plug our own ears and flood our own life with noise instead of listening to the invitation to look to Christ. I mean, I got a bunch of noise right here. I got a lot of noise right here, and it's real easy to keep my head down. Looking down all the time. Maybe we too plug our ears and shout at the uncomfortable invitation to look at our world a little bit differently. Because you got to know that invitation to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God was an invitation to confession. It was an invitation to say, maybe I've been wrong. Maybe I ought not to have executed this person from Nazareth. They shut up their ears because they didn't want to face themselves and what they'd done in their past. I don't know about you, but it's real easy to just say, well, I, uh, I don't know, I don't, uh, I'm busy. My calendar's pretty full. I don't have time for this. How often do we plug our ears or flood our life with noise? <clears throat> I want to end this morning with a brief story that I have permission to share. Um, part of our conversation on Wednesday was when Kayla and I were uh, having breakfast and having coffee together. She gave per me permission to share this story, but <clears throat> over the last week, um, Kayla had been kind of feeling out of sorts had been a little, just kind of, I don't know, what's the word? What's the word? Angry, agitated, just kind of short, just kind of like not, not, uh, not very happy, or, and just really kind of a shorter fuse, and just kind of angry, that's a good word. She had just been kind of angry, and didn't really know why, couldn't put her finger on anything, couldn't, you know, our, our girls have been sleeping more, so thanks be to God. Um, get a little bit more sleep than we did six months ago. Um, just kind of was like off, just, just off, you know? You ever have those seasons where you're just a little off and you're a little short and you're just kind of upset and angry? She, she, she had been kind of feeling that for a few days. And Tuesday night, we were in bed praying like we do every night before we go to sleep. We always spend a few minutes in prayer together before going to sleep. And, and that night, as we were praying, Kayla prayed. And it was in that moment where it became incredibly clear to her. As she was praying, she was, she was praying for, for God to be present with her and to be present with what she had been feeling. And there was almost a, a sense of confession in that, that she said, Lord, I'm not looking forward to this experience that's coming up. I'm not excited about this thing that's happening in my life in a few days. There was an event that Kayla and I had uh, that she was really not looking forward to. The circumstance was not something she was anticipating and did not want to be a part of that. And so as she was praying... She said, Lord, I, I realize that I've been looking at that moment so much 
in a negative anticipation that it has been affecting the ways in which I'm interacting with my family, those I love, that Kayla had been keeping her eyes down, looking at this unanticipated, undesirable circumstance that was in front of her. And when she looked to Christ in prayer, she got clarity about her own spirit. And she said it felt like the Lord lifted this burden off of her and provided clarity to her. Because when you are faced with a transcendent God who we confess knows us, we can't hide from ourselves. When you look to a God who sees you, guess what? You can't cover yourself anymore because you're seen. And there was nothing particularly unique about that night of prayer other than Kayla's gaze towards Christ. She looked to Christ and in that moment was able to say, this is why I've been angry, this is why I've been upset, because my gaze has been fixed here. My gaze has not been fixed here. And when she turned her eyes to Christ, she received clarity for herself. And she received grace for herself. Looking to Christ gave her a new perspective. Now, Kayla was not under threat of being executed. And I don't think you or I are going to be under threat of execution anytime soon. But I think that there's good news in this. And that we too can be like that Sanhedrin with our eyes stuck, looking down, plugging our ears and shouting. When there's one inviting us to say, look, the Son of Man is at the right hand of the Father. Church, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The world around you may be swirling. It might feel like you just can't catch a break. It might feel that life is pulling you down. It might feel like the world around you is collapsing. I wasn't anticipating sharing this. Um, and I usually, I, I'll say I don't think I ever have uh, wanted to point out visitors in our midst, but I'm incredibly blessed to have a classmate of mine and his family with us today. Pablo is a peer of mine at Calvin Seminary. Uh, we've studied together. We've taken a class together. We interact frequently. Pablo and his family are here from Ukraine. Pablo came February 23rd of 2022. Russia invaded Ukraine on what date? 15 minutes after you landed, February 23rd, 2022. <clears throat> we might feel like the world around us is collapsing, but for some folks in this world, it really is. All that they know and all that they've experienced has collapsed. And I've prayed with Pablo for his extended family in Ukraine under threat of bombs. And yet, whenever we interact, whenever we talk, whenever we have conversations at the seminary together, I am struck by the joy, by the joy that I experience in my classmate and in my brother in Christ. Just kind of this deep well of joy. Certainly there's grief, but there's an in incredible amount of hope. And, and, and that's the word I, I have to use is joy. Keep your eyes on Jesus, church. The world around you might crumble. I love the line we sung a few moments ago. I've still got joy in chaos. 
How is it that when everything around us collapses, sometimes because it's out of our control, sometimes because we have brought that calamity upon ourselves, how is it that we can say, I've got joy in chaos, the world around me might crumble, but I have a peace, I have joy, there is a hope still, even though the world around me is falling to pieces. And I don't want to diminish what we experience as chaos and calamity in our own lives either. Because I don't know about you, but we are being formed to fill our ears and to fill our life with noise in the face of the chaos. The algorithms are written that way to keep you coming back to noisy things. But if you keep your eyes on Christ, if you keep your gaze upon the resurrected one who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, chances are you'll gain some perspective. Now, it might not change your circumstance. It might not make things different in your world. Kayla still had to go through that experience she wasn't anticipating. But she could do it with gratitude and grace because her eyes were fixed upon Christ. It might not change the circumstance. Stephen was still stoned to death after all, church. He was still murdered. How could he say, do not hold this sin against them? How could he say that? He could say that because his gaze was fixed upon Christ. By keeping your gaze fixed upon the resurrected and ascended one, that is how we don't lose ourselves. That is how we keep ourselves in the midst of a broken and breaking world. What is there to preach in this passage? What good news is there in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 59? The good news is that you can keep your gaze fixed upon Christ. The good news is that whatever's happening around us, we can look to Christ and things might come into focus a bit. The division and the distraction of the brokenness around you might lose its grip upon your spirit. And you might just, you might not lose yourself in the chaos and in the violence. And you might just be saved from becoming a member of the stone throwing community. You want the good news, the good news is to keep your eyes on Christ. That is the good news of Jesus Christ for us today. 